Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you for the lesson that we are going to um, review at this time. Give us uh, wisdom so we can understand. Give us um, the open mind so we can uh, embrace it. And give us an open heart so we can love it. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. I did not try to find another title. I just kept the title um, on the quarterly. Retributive uh, punishment. Okay? That sounds kind of uh, tough, huh? But uh, that's the, the, the title of the lesson. Retributive punishment. And um, this is um, a theme that we can find in different places in the Bible. And we can take it as it is and think uh, that God is the, the God that punish, punishes uh, people as the result of their disobedience and present the, that kind of God to the people. Or we can find out if, if that's the only side that God possesses. All right? So that's the main uh, purpose of this lesson, that we can learn about this and what the Bible says. All right, so let's recap a little bit. Um, Job was in, in pain. He was, uh, his, his body was uh, all sore, and he had a, and he had a rush, and he was scratching with a piece of um, a clay, right? So um, the three friends made an appointment and decided to visit him. Uh, they did. They made a trip. And while they were at some distance, they saw Job. But they got shocked. They were in shock because uh, they couldn't even recognize him. So his situation was so frustrating that they start crying. They start weeping. So they got at the place he was sitting down, and they sat down around him. And for seven days, they didn't say a word, not a single word. They only saw him, wept, and cried around him. All right? No, it's not. OK. So, for a moment, well, it's not a moment, for a little time, Job thought that um, he was uh, being comforted by his friends. Because they, they didn't say a word, but they were there, right? So, so he felt like, oh, I have my friends. They're here with me in my sore, in my soreness, in my pain, in my difficult time, my suffering. They're here. So um, he felt well for seven days until the first of his friends start talking. And that's what we uh, started the last week, right? About um, Eliphaz. But, so today, we're going to see what um, Bildad said and, once, and what so far said. So now we want to start going to Job chapter 8 and verses three to six, um, book of Job, verse eight, and chapters, uh, or verses three to six. And it says, does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When, you, when your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will look to God and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself in, on your behalf and restore you to your rightful place. So what were they saying? Or what was uh, Bill that saying? Uncle Rufo, take this.
What he's saying is, God is righteous. He is doing to you and your family what is right. If your sons were sinners, they just received what they deserved. That's what he's saying. Is that right? Yes, it is. How do you say no? Yes, it is. Somehow. The problem is, the problem is the time or the moment when they were saying these things. That's the problem. Because if you are suffering of any disease and you have lost 10 children, all your children, and what you have is your husband and he's not very helpful, and someone comes in and says, well, your children were sinners and they just received what they deserved. How do you feel? You don't feel okay. Huh? The suffering is intensified. The suffering is intensified because now you you add something emotionally to your suffering. Well, you already have an emotional suffering for all the loss, right? But now it, it, it becomes worse. Okay, so what they were saying was right theologically. But the problem was that they are presenting one side of God. And this is the thing, that's what I, 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 I outlined it this way, Job's friend's theology, because that was their theology. And the, and the other thing is, they were defending God. That's what they thought. Let's remember, they didn't have any book like we have the Bible today. They didn't have any scripture. So all they knew is what the older generations passed on orally. Yes oral communication so they don't have anything uh, written down so that's what they learned and that's the way they they saw it they they for sure knew about the flood let's go to this we're gonna have to interchange it uh, let's go to the flood uh, the story of the flood the book of Genesis um, chapter 6 Verses 5 to 8. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts or his heart, his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made a man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind so I, whom I am created, so I, whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along, along the ground and birds of the earth, for I am grieved that I have made them. So uh, until there, we can see that um, the story of the flood, it's... Um, very much the same what Bildad was trying to say. The, the, the man has sinned, the man is, is a wicked person, so I am going to destroy it. That's what Bildad said. The, the sinners have to receive what is right. Yes? Uh, I don't know if you have, uh, maybe it's not related, but uh, I want to ask you something. Uh, uh, do you know why is God saying he will destroy the animals? I understand the mankind, but why the animals? Um, well, I, I I have an idea, but um, I don't think it's it's it's, it's good to present it here on video. <laughs> All right, we can talk about it. All right, um, but now let's read these other two verses, verses uh, thirteen and fourteen, Genesis five. Uh, I mean six, Genesis six, verses uh, thirteen and fourteen. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all the people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. But here, verse 14. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. 
make rooms in it encoded with pitch inside and out. So what does it mean? I'm going to destroy. I'm going to make myself righteous. I'm going to exercise my righteousness because that's fair. But, verse 14, make yourself an ark. There's one way out to escape the punishment. Of course, it's not just entering to the ark. In order to enter to the ark, what do they have to do? Believe. They have to believe that what Noah is preaching uh, for all those 120 years is true. They have to believe that it's going to rain where never has been rained before. They have to believe that the ark is going to be, it, it is the plan of God for saving the people. They have to believe that every, as the Ellen White puts it, every hit of the hammer was the grace of God while they were building the ark. So let's, let's compare now. Job's friends' theology, according to them, God is righteous. And what Job is suffering is just right because he deserves it. Okay? God has to be right because they are sinners. They knew about the flood because their story is after the flood. Okay? They lived after the flood, so they knew about it. But even in the story of the flood, we find God's mercy and grace in the ark. All right? All right. Now, um, we can, we can just uh, go a little bit further here. Verses 20, let's go back to Job, verses 20 to 22. Uh -huh. Are you reading Job 8? Six. Oh, no, no, it's 8. Surely God does not reject a blameless man or strengthen the hands of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. That's the way he ends. But after saying, if you have a secret sin you have to confess it that's what that's why you are suffering because you are a sinner and you have sins but God will restore you if you confess that's what he's saying but now I want to um, take you to Romans uh, chapter 3 um, because uh, that's uh, somehow the problem with us especially being Seventh-day Adventists because uh, we like to uh, present how God will punish those who disobey the law. The law. Um, Romans chapter 3 and verses uh, 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Until that is fine, according to Bildad's uh, theology. But... He keeps saying, verse 24, uh, and are justified, he says, for all have seen fa and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. So when we are presenting only verse 23, we are presenting only one side of God. And we're not presenting His grace. And we have to present his grace. So the gospel is composed by two sides in this case. And we have to present both sides. Otherwise, the gospel that we are preaching is just uh, cut in half. Which is not right. All right? All right. Now let's go to the other uh, guy so far. Um, after uh, a couple of uh, chapters where Job um, speaks out... Um, 
the other friend comes in and he said, well, I'm going to talk. Now it's my turn. This is the third one. I don't know how many of you would like to have some friends like that. <laughs> you are in your sufferings and they're just hammering on you what they think you have done, right? But uh, <laughs> that's what happened. Okay, so Job um, spoke and, and, he, and he said, no, you don't know me. You don't know my kids. Let's remember that Job offered sacrifices on behalf of his children. Because if they sin, he said, I am interceding in their behalf, right? And, and that's what God planned ahead before the, 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 they start doing it. So he was doing just what God planned. And by the faith, they were uh, forgiven. So now the other guy speaks, and um, that's what he says, um, chapter 11 on Job, verses 2 to 5. It says, are all these words go to go unanswered? Talking about Job's words. Is this tucker to be vindicated? Will you idle or idle talk reduce men to silence? Will no, will no one rebuke you when you mock? You said to God, my beliefs are flawless. And I am pure in your sight. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. So what he's saying is, you are talking just because you have a mouth, but you don't know what you're talking. I, I would like that God speak out and tell you what you have doing wrong, what you have been doing wrong, so now you will understand. And we can read, uh, oh, sorry, this is not 11. This is verses 11 to 19. Okay. Um, verse 11 says, Surely he recognizes deceitful men, and when he sees evil, does he not take note? But... Uh, a witless man can no more become wise than a wild donkey's colt can be born a man. Yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then you will lift up your face without shame. You will stand firm without fear. That's what... Uh, Job's friend is telling to Job. What kind of friend is that? So in other words, he's saying the same as Bildad said. You deserve it. Your, your children deserve what they suffered. So death. If you are in a situation where um, a friend of you is suffering because of the loss of a chil uh, child, would you go to him or her and say, what, he's, what, he, what happened to him or to her is because he deserves it? Would you say that? There's no way. And sometimes it's better just to remain silent. So the first seven days for Job were great because he felt their compassion. But after the first time when um, um, Eliphaz started speaking, then he understood that they were not there just to support him. They were to rebuke him. They were to judge him. They were there to say, this is what you're doing wrong, trying to correct him. Okay? So now, let's go to see the other um, example that we find here. Let's go now to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's in the book of Genesis, chapter 18. Is that the Quinto book, Lord? Okay, uh, 
Genesis 18, 20 to 23, and it says, um, Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remaining standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? So what we find here is two cities. In both cities, they deserve to be destroyed according to the justice of God. Sodom and Gomorrah deserve to be destroyed. But then, we find in verse 23 that Abraham comes in and speaks out. And he said, will you destroy the just or the righteous along with the wicked? And God said, well, if there's anyone righteous, man, I will not destroy the city. I will not destroy the place. And then we know the, the, the rest of the story. Abraham negotiates and deals with God until uh, he goes all the way down. Not He started with 50 people, and then he went all the way down to 10. And God said, if there's 10 righteous people, I will not destroy the city. We know the, the end of the story. There, there, there was nobody but Lot and his family. So they were taken out. In Gomorrah, in Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. So, um, what is the the the, the parallel um, teaching here? So, so far said to Job, "You deserve it, right?" And they probably knew about Sodom and Gomorrah. They probably knew about it, okay? And they knew how God destroyed the city. But at the same time, Abraham tried to save the just he tried to save the righteous man okay so god is just and that's the the the, the teaching and at the same time that we are presented the destruction of sodom and gomorrah let's go to mark uh chapter 15 and verse uh, verses 3 to 5 the gospel of mark fifteen. Verses 3 to 5. The chief priest accused him, talking about Jesus, accused him of many things. So again, Pilate, Pilate, or Pilate? No. Pilate. Pilate. Asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing, accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. So the thing is, um, the teaching here is, both Bildad and Sofar, they thought they were defending God from what Job was talking, from what Job was questioning about his suffering. And what we see here in Mark chapter 15, 3 to 5, is that Jesus, he kept silent when he was accused. And, and, and the governor was amazed that he remained silent. So uh, God doesn't need to be defended by the human. Can we defend God? We can defend what we believe, but we cannot defend him. He is able to defend himself, right? So sometimes... When we are confronting with other people, with other beliefs, and we think that we are going to destroy them with, with uh, our beliefs, we're doing just the same as, as Bildad and so far. We are presenting God in a, in a wrong way. And God does not need to be defended. We just have to present the gospel and share the gospel, and God will do the rest. All right? 
All right. And um, there's another um, story that we need to um, mention. is the, the story about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We know the story, right? They rebelled against Moses. They thought that Moses was going so far. He said, why do you think that you are the leader among us? You delivered us from the bondage of Egypt. That's fine. But we have gone so far. This is a holy people. Israel is holy. So we don't need you and we don't need your brother Aaron. So um, we can see what um, Moses responded to Korah. Let's go to the book of Numbers in uh, chapter 16. Verses 1 to 7. And it says, Korah, son of Aishar, son of uh, Koath, the son of Levi, and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abiram, son of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. They came as, as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far. The whole community is holy, very one of them, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. When then do you set yourselves about the Lord's assembly? When Moses heard this, he fell face down. This is the first thing that we have to notice. Moses fell uh, with his face down. So in position of praise and adoration. Um, then he said to Korah and all his followers, in the morning the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy and he will have that person come near to him. The man who chooses, he will cause to come near him. You, Korah, and all your followers are to do this. Take censers, and tomorrow put fire and the incense in them before the Lord. The man the Lord chooses will be the one who is holy. In you, Levites, have gone too far. So what is happening here is after the rebellion of these three guys, Moses fell down with his face down in position of adoration and pray in prayer so what he does is prays to he prayer he prays to God so uh, God may show who is the one who he chooses to be the leader of the assembly or to leader of the of the nation of Israel so uh, the Lord will show is are the words that he said that's what he said the Lord will show um, and we know the end of the story. The earth just, the, the ground just opened and swallowed these three guys with their entire families. And then the, 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 the ground just closed up and they disappeared alive. Right? So, um, so God showed. God showed who was the appointed one. Right? So um, there's one more text that I that I have, and that's in Daniel chapter 12. We all know this text. Um, the book of Daniel chapter 12, in verse 1. At that time, Michael... The great prince who protects your people will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as not has happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So God will show what will be his salvation. God will show what is, what, is, uh, the, what the people has to do. God will show. At the end, 
they were killed. They disappeared. But God showed his mercy. God showed who is in control. He is in control. And then, speaking about the end of the time, he says that Michael, the great prince, will arise and will deliver his people. So what we can see here is Job's friend's theology was presenting. It was right, but presenting only one side of God. The righteousness of God, talking about uh, retributive punishment. Um, people is receiving what they deserve, and that's right. But also we uh, find in the Bible that at the same time that God is righteous, he presents his grace, as we can see in Genesis 6.14, with the building... Uh, when they built the ark, which was a, a, a way of escape, the, the, the punishment. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God uh, has Abraham interceding for the people, for the righteous men. And in the story of Korah, Dayton, and Abiram, God showed who has him selected to be the leader of the people. So at the end, we can see that God shows himself in a different way. He shows his mercy. He shows his righteousness. He shows his will. And that's the other side of the coin. If we are going to present a theology about the suffering, if we are going to present a theology about God's character, if we are trying to defend God's uh, teachings, we have to present the entire message. We cannot present what we think is just what they need to hear. So um, may God help us and can and hopefully we can learn more from this uh, lesson. Any question? No? Have a word of prayer. Thank you Sovereign Lord. Thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for scripture because um, a difference of uh, Job's friends, they didn't have scripture. They, they had history. They have uh, things that happened around them. But now we, all, we not only have history, but we also have scripture. Help us to do a little bit better than them. Help us to present the gospel in, entirely, in all the sides and all the sides of your character. So that way we can present you as you are. Thank you for this lesson. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.